Um, uh, special thanks to Professor De Roche and Hassan Shahdi for organizing this wonderful uh, co uh, conference. Um, so I, I made a small uh, adjustment to the, the title of my paper here. Um, I wanted to focus in a little bit on a, on a specific principle of a Quranic textual criticism. So I wanted to revisit a principle of Quranic textual criticism. And specifically, this has to do with the role of Quranic self-similarity. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and, and how it affects and how it, uh, um, it influences scribal habits uh, uh, in the Quran. Uh, so many of us here who uh, engage in the textual criticism of, of the Qur'an rely in some way, shape, or form on the taxonomies that have been developed in, in uh, biblical uh, uh, textual criticism. Uh, and there are several, and so here I just borrowed uh, uh, one by Emmanuel Tov, and here he essentially uh, uh, splits up uh, variants. So this is, this is the characterization of variants uh, into minuses and pluses. So this is a more uh, objective way of, of describing variants compared to omissions uh, and additions. Uh, and those, of course, you know, can be broken further down into random omissions and haplographies, et cetera. Uh, the same also applies to pluses. You have ditographies, uh, you can have doublets. And then there's a catch-all category of changes. So this can be you know, ascribe interchanging uh, uh, letters due to graphic similarity uh, or phonetic similarity. Uh, sometimes you see transpositions and uh, the blurring of word boundaries, uh, matter lexionis, and, and all different kinds of things here. So, uh, and this is just one way to characterize variants, one way to, to classify uh, and describe variants that, uh, that we find. And many of us also apply this same characterization uh, to uh, variants that we see in Quranic manuscripts. Now, I wanted to highlight just a few examples that I've selected uh, for breadth and not uh, uh, just kind of a random selection of, of variants that highlight that these, these kinds of uh, scribal errors and variants are present uh, in, in Quranic manuscripts. So in the example of a random omission here, uh, we have, for example, the scribe uh, meant to write uh, but, the, but the scribe omitted the alif. And really, there's nothing else to it. Uh, just there's a random omission, which happens sometimes in the process of copying. Uh, and by the way, these kinds of errors are not limited to early Quranic manuscripts. So here we have a Mamluk era uh, uh, Quran manuscript where we have what's called uh, homeo arctan. So the, the scribe was, so there's parablipsis. So the scribe was looking off to the side, copying from an exemplar. And this is uh, Q47. So this is Surat uh, Muhammad. Uh, and so we have, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا And the next verse is actually, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ ارْتَدُّوا So that's how the verse begins. Uh, but the scribe, due to the, the, the similarity in the beginnings of the verses, the scribe's eye jumps to inna kafaru wa saddu an sabilillah. And you can see here in the margin, the scribe filled, I mean, he skipped quite a number of verses, about six verses. And so you can see here in the margin, the scribe had to you know, fill in uh, the gap here once they, they noticed their mistake. So we see these kinds of things as well. We see transpositions. Uh, so here, for example, in Q1433, we have a semsh instead of a shems. So the scribe transposed uh, the dots on the scene and, and the sheen. Now we get these uh, kinds of, of uh, uh, variants as well uh, in the regional variants. So this is a regional variant that distinguishes the Syrian and Medinan uh, uh, exemplars from the, the uh, Iraqi ones. So here, for example, we have wala yakhafu uqbaha and fala yakhafu. And what's interesting here is this could, this could be an example of graphic similarity. So uh, uh, in this particular uh, position, the waw and the fa are, are graphically very, very similar, except one connects to the uh, uh, succeeding letter and the other one doesn't. So one can imagine a scenario where um, a waw was written too close to the lam alif, or the line connecting the fa to the lam alif was faint, and resulted in going from fala to wala or wala to fala. And that can be responsible for that degree of variation as well. Uh, so not only are these present at the level of regional variants, one could make the case that we get these kinds of variants in the uh, archetype itself, the Uthmanic archetype. In this case, uh, it would potentially be a haplography uh, and a word division variant. So in, uh, in Q74, verse 33, we have wallayli idh adbara, or depending on the reading, wallayli idha dabara. So the word division is blurry. Does that alif belong to the idh, or does that alif belong to dabara? Uh, 
And what's interesting is the verse right after that is وَالصُّبْحِ إِذَا أَسْفَرُ So, it, 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 you know, it seems uh, interesting, or it seems likely that potentially this verse was وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا أَدْبَرُ So it would have originally been meant to be written with two alifs, but the scribe forgot to transcribe one of them. And we see in a number of early manuscripts, we see, you can see the alif here was erased. We have إِذَا أَدْبَرَ and also here we have إِذَا with the alif erased, إِذَا أَدْبَرَ uh, But of course in other manuscripts such as this one I have up here, this is a B2 manuscript, we have what's in the received text uh, or the Cairo edition, we have إِذَا دَبَرَ or إِذْ أَدْبَرَ uh, So these are just some, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a selection of the kinds of variants that fall into the different categories uh, that I highlighted uh, earlier. Now, we can distinguish between characterizing the variants themselves and describing the causes of those errors or the causes of the variance. So in three broad categories, we have faulty eyesight. So, you know, this is a, a slightly different one, but here we have yawma khalaqa. And you can see as the scribe was writing, uh, one, you could imagine that the scribe's eye just shifted a little bit to the next word, khalaqa, the qaf, and began writing a qaf here before realizing their mistake, and then they, they very, very elegantly erased it and then converted it into a meme. Uh, uh, and this, is, this happens in, in Q9. Uh, one can also make the case that there are examples of faulty hearing. So, so here we have uh, the example of وَلَلَبَسْنَا So this, the, the received text is وَلَلَبَسْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ مَا يَلْبِسُونَ And the scribe here wrote عَلَيْهِ مِمَّا يَلْبِسُونَ Now, one could argue that this is the result of, of dictation and the scribe might have misheard something, but it could also be described reading out loud as they were writing and just mixing up alayhi mimma and alayhim ma yalbisun. We see that as well. And of course, we get errors of the mind, and this is a very broad category. Uh, and what I wanted to focus on specifically is one particular type of error of the mind, which is assimilation of parallels. And this idea, uh, this assimilation of parallels is is to assimilate or to harmonize the wording of one passage to the slightly different wording in a parallel passage. All right? Now, one interesting and, and unique thing about the Quran is that it is highly self-similar. Right? So I, I, I took this passage from Behnam Sadegi's study of, uh, of the Sana'a Palimsas because I, I thought it described this phenomenon very well. So he says that the Quran is and calls itself self-similar. Kitaban mutashabihan. It is full of repeated sentences and phrases that differ in one, two, or a few words. That is why even today, memorizers routinely find themselves adding or substituting a word inadvertently if the added word appears in a similar sentence in a different verse. One's knowledge of other passages shapes one's memory of the verse at hand, generating substitutions, additions, and deletions that hark to the parallel. Also here we have sort of a quantitative look on the Qur'anic self-similarity. This is from Andrew Bannister's uh, uh, dissertation uh, and a subsequent monograph. And here he quantifies what he calls formulaic density. How often are Qur'anic formulas repeated in different surahs? And, and the upshot of this, what I'm simply trying to highlight here, is that the Qur'an has a high formulaic density. It is very self-similar. And I want to show how this plays a role in uh, uh, generating mechanisms. One other thing I wanted to add to this is that, you know, recently, you know, Gabriel Said Reynolds looked at doublets. They are verses that are very self-similar in the context of source criticism. So here's an example of two self-similar verses. So, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيِّتَةَ وَالدَّمَا وَلَحْمَ الْخِنْزِيرِ And so here we have, in, in, in uh, Q2, we have, وَمَا أُهِلَّ بِهِ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ and then we have a transposition in Q16, وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ And then towards the verse end, we have فَمَنُ الطِّرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ And then we have the addition of فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ which is lacking in this verse. And then we have فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ and إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So you can see how this is very, very tricky. Uh, uh, to get right. There's a small transposition, there's an, an addition here, and then a فَإِنَّ instead of إِنَّ now, as far as I'm aware, the only systematic exploration of the, the role of Qur'anic self-similarity uh, uh, within the context of textual criticism was Behnam's study of the undertext of the Sana'a Palimpsest. Uh, and so here I just have a couple examples of how he applied it 
uh, in essentially uh, creating or, or, uh, a stemma or, or de describing the relationship between the Uthmanic text type and what he calls the C1 text type. So here, for example, in the Uthmanic text, we have وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ And then in C the C1 text, so uh, the undertext, we have وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ So we have, we have كُلُّهُ added in here. And what he, he observes is this particular phrase with كُلُّهُ occurs elsewhere in the Uthmanic text. So the word kulluhu would have been expected here for somebody familiar with the language of the Quran. Uh, and then we have here in the Uthmanic text, it's wakatabna alayhim. So there's a pronoun here, alayhim. And then we have in the C1 text, we have wakatabna ala bani Israel. So specifically ala bani Israel. And he points out that this phrase, exact phrase, katabna ala bani Israel, occurs shortly before. Uh, Q545 and Q532. So the proximity of this occurrence might explain why we get وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ in the Sana'a undertext. And so the point I'm trying to highlight or I want to make here is that we can actually apply this principle systematically as well to the Uthmanic text type. So all the manuscripts that belong to the Uthmanic text type. Uh, and so what I want to do is go through a few examples. So here we have, you know, in Q47, verse uh, 26, we have, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لِلَّذِينَ كَرِهُوا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهِ So this is the received text. In the Cairo edition, we find مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهِ But then when we look at a number of early manuscripts, and this is not exhaustive, we find مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ And here we can see the alif is erased. مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ Same here. مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ The alif is erased. And so, at, at first glance, one would be tempted to say, perhaps the original Uthmanic text was ma anzalallah, right? So not only is it found in the majority of early manuscripts, but these span different text types, uh, different regional uh, uh, traditions. So they are on different branches of the stemma of the Uthmanic text. Uh, so one would say it's very compelling to say that potentially uh, the original text was ma anzalallah, and for uh, perhaps whatever reason, uh, uh, that was changed or it, it was received differently as manazir Allah. But this is an incomplete picture. If we actually look at Q47.9, so just a, a short number of verses earlier, we have, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالَهُمْ And you can see how this is very similar to verse you know, uh, uh, 26, where we have ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لِلَّذِينَ كَرِهُوا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهِ And in fact, if we just expand our breadth a little bit and look at some other manuscripts, we find uh, مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهِ For example, in the Meshhad Codex in St. Petersburg E20, and also in the, the Husseini uh, Codex as well. Uh, and here, one would, uh, would realize that because of self-similarity, because of the assimilation of nearby terms, one can make the case to prefer the received text over what is predominantly found in early Quranic manuscripts. Another application of the assimilation uh, of parallels is the ability to assign textual priority. So in, in, in my study of the regional variants, I constructed this uh, uh, basically genealogy or network uh, uh, describing the relationship between the different uh, uh, Uthmanic text type, the, uh, the different regional uh, texts. Uh, but, but what you can't do simply by studying the variants uh, alone is discern which of the Syrian, Medinan, uh, Basran, and Kufan uh, exemplars was the archetype, was the original. Uh, but a closer look at the regional variants allows us to use uh, this uh, assimilation of parallels to actually identify uh, a potential archetype. So here, for example, we have uh, in the Syrian uh, uh, exemplar, uh, the wow is not present. قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا So this is uh, Q2, 116. But what we find in Q1068 is قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا So the Syrian one lacks the wow, and so we can see that, we can make the case that potentially the scribe uh, harmonized these two verses. Uh, in Q3, 184, we have جَاءُوا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَبِالزُّبُرِ وَالْكِتَابِ الْمُنِيرِ and then in Q3525, this edition of the Ba in the Syrian manuscript is found. We also have in Q632, uh, uh, we have the uh, uh, Syrian variant which lacks the lamb. 
versus the other uh, um, the, uh, regional uh, variants, which uh, And then we can see in Q12, 109, Q16, 30, we have as well. So again, one can start building a case that the directionality of textual priority goes from the Syrian uh, uh, tradition to the Medinan one. And then we can look at, for example, a Kufan variant. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا So the, the uh, uh, Ihsan, Ihsana here is present in the Kufan uh, uh, exemplar. And then when we look at Q29.8, we actually have Husna. And that would make one tempted to say that the Kufan variant would take priority. However, if we just expand our, our, our view a little bit, we see many times the same type of phrase. Again, very similar but not identical. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And so one can make the case how the more frequent occurrence of بِالْوَالِدَيْنِ and إِحْسَانًا influenced the scribe to uh, uh, write إِحْسَانًا uh, in Q46.15 and therefore we can make the case that in both directions textual priority is assigned to the Medinan uh, uh, regional exemplar and therefore, one could argue how the Medinan text is perhaps the Uthmanic archetype. Now, this doesn't really stop here. So the examples I presented earlier, for example, in, in uh, uh, you know, with Ma'anzal Allah, one could argue that that is, you know, just the influence of a close verse uh, on the scribe who is copying. So can we find something that's uh, uh, that goes beyond the closeness of, of that example. So, so here I have an example from uh, uh, this manuscript from the Museum of Islamic Arts in, in Doha and Qatar. Uh, it's MS 474, 2003. And so here in Q6, An'am, verse 92, we have, بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَلِتُنْذِرَ أُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ and so here we have, we can see already that the scribe, let's say, forgot the wall, litunvira, instead of walitunvira. And then we see something else here that's been erased. Whether or not the original scribe erased it or it was someone else, it doesn't matter, but there was something else written here. And then we have, you know, the wall, walladina yu'minu, sorry, we had, sorry, walladina yu'minuna bil akhirati. And then, I don't know, wa yu'minuna bihi here. But, but the point I want to make is, if we actually zoom in a little bit, we see وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا wa, And then here we have the, the, the faint tracing of تُنْذِرَ يَوْم تُنْذِرَ يَوْم And in fact, if we look at Q42.7, we see لِتُنْذِرَ أُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا وَتُنْذِرَ يَوْمَ الْجَمْعِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ So it appears that the scribe, as they were copying, were jumped from Q6 to Q42, realized their mistake, and started copying from Q6 again. Now, what's interesting here is these, these two verses are in vastly different parts uh, of the Qur'an. And we can actually start to understand and profile what was happening in the mind of the scribe. So the scribe recalled a portion of a similar verse at this location. Now, what this implies is that the scribe must have been well acquainted with the contents of the Qur'an. Because you cannot recall something that you never learned. So the scribe either knew that verse by heart or had copied enough Qur'ans that they were, had some degree of familiarity with the text that resulted in them making this mistake. And that the scribe was presumably not glancing at the exemplar the moment they copied that portion of text. But the scribe recognized their mistake and corrected themselves, and that's likely when they glanced back at the exemplar they were copying from. So we can get detailed insight into a very precise mechanism of what might have happened in that instance. And the thing that, I think the interesting implication of this is that it indicates to us, and this is not unique, so this is found in, in I mean, I've, I've seen this across a number of manuscripts, and what's interesting here is that what this does is it tells us that the process of written transmission was probably more complex than a, a very mechanical letter-for-letter -letter copying. And I, I give the example here of Ni'mat Allah, which highlights you know, Marayn Van Puta's is paper that I think it very conv convincingly shows that the Qur'an, you know, the Uthmanic text, was transmitted through writing. But, that, but what I want to highlight here is it's actually a little bit more subtle. 
Uh, and in fact, when we look at other types of, of uh, um, orthographic practices in the Quran, like monoverbation, so innama as two separate words, words versus innama as one word, we see a lot more variation uh, in manuscripts compared to certain phrases like ni'matullah. Uh, and, and so to me, this indicates that scribes had some degree, perhaps intimate familiarity with the text of the Quran that led them to make these kinds of mistakes, that led assimilations of parallel to influence their, uh, uh, the fidelity of their copying. Uh, and uh, finally, what I wanted to do is highlight that all of this falls under the umbrella of the genre. Uh, there's actually a genre of literature out there called Mutashabih al-Quran. And so one of the earliest works in the subject is actually by al-Kisai, uh, who is one of the seven ca canonical readers. And there's a modern manifestation of this, which are print Qurans that are designed for hufab, for memorizers of the Qur'an, and they've, what they do is they highlight in red portions of text that have highly similar uh, uh, but slightly different phrases in other portions uh, of the Qur'an, and then they give examples of those in the margins uh, of, the, uh, of the page. And what's very interesting is one can go to a text like this, so uh, this, an annotated uh, mushaf, and can look up instances where uh, you know, the author or authors of these works have highlighted mutashabihat and can go to manuscripts and, ident and, and, and fairly reliably find locations where scribes have made mistakes. And so I guess with that, I, I realize I'm out of time and, and I'll stop here. And I, I, I hope you all can appreciate how important self-similarity is when we start applying uh, uh, the fundamentals of textual criticism to the transmission of Quranic manuscripts. Thank you.